Modern. 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 We're prepping for a voyage. Modern. The force of an old-fashioned equals whiskey mass times bitters acceleration. Why don't you make that a double? Modern Bar Cart. What's shaking, cocktail fans? Welcome back to another episode of the Modern Bar Cart Podcast. I'm your host, Eric Koslick, and in this episode, we've got a great interview with Maggie Hoffman, author of The One Bottle Cocktail. We've been trying to get more cocktail authors to come on the show and talk about their projects, so if you've got anyone in mind you'd really like us to interview, please email your suggestions to podcast at modernbarcart.com, and we'll do our best to make your dreams come true. And don't think this is just limited to author recommendations. Send us your questions, your theme episode ideas, even blogs or articles that spark your imagination, and we'll try and put together something special just for you. And now, it's time for you to make yourself a drink. This week's featured cocktail is brought to you, in fact, by a slight slip of the tongue I had during last week's episode. We received a comment on the show notes page from Michael, who pointed out that I may have indicated that green chartreuse was an ingredient in a Vucare cocktail. It's not the case, and the way I worded things, it definitely sounded like that's what I was saying. So, to set the record straight, the Vucare is going to be this week's featured cocktail. The phrase Vucare translates to old quarter and refers to the French Quarter of New Orleans, where some of the most iconic cocktails, including the Sazerac and the French 75, were invented. And if the Sazerac is New Orleans' version of the old-fashioned, the Vucare is sort of its own unique spin on the Manhattan. To make one, you'll need three quarters of an ounce of rye whiskey, three quarters of an ounce of cognac, three quarters of an ounce of sweet vermouth, one bar spoon of Benedictine, which is roughly an eighth of an ounce, sometimes between a quarter ounce and an eighth of an ounce, depending on the size of your bar spoon, and then several dashes of aromatic bitters. This is a stirred drink, so you combine all those ingredients in a mixing glass with ice, stir it well, and strain into any glass you please. Some people enjoy this drink served up in a stemmed glass, and others prefer to sip it over a large rock in a lowball glass. Either way is totally fine. Don't let anybody tell you otherwise. In terms of garnishes, you've got a couple of accepted routes that you can go here. One would be a cocktail cherry, and the other would be an expressed lemon twist. If you're using a spicy rye and a really dark vermouth, maybe you want to lift that with a lemon twist. But if you're using maybe a milder rye and a nice light vermouth, maybe opt for the cocktail cherry instead. I'm just thinking out loud. That's what I would do. One legend I really enjoy about the Vucare is that each of its ingredients are said to represent a key cultural demographic of the city of New Orleans. The cognac represents, of course, the city's French roots. The rye represents its role in the expansion of the American frontier. The sweet vermouth is a tribute to the city's significant Italian population. And the bitters, whether you're using the called-for Angostura or a Creole style like Peychaud's or our very own embitterment aromatic bitters, are said to be a gesture to the Caribbean influence in the city. So we've got the French, the American, the Italian, and the Caribbean all in one cocktail. It's one of my favorite drinks, and the reason why I mistakenly slipped up and implied that it contained green chartreuse last week is because I was thinking about the significant commonalities it shared with the other two cocktails I was talking about at the time, last week's Tipperary cocktail and the Diamondback. Like the Vucare, both of those contain whiskey, sweet vermouth, and a significant herbal liqueur component. Really, what I should have done was mention Benedictine, which is another French liqueur made by monks. Like chartreuse, it uses a ton of herbs and spices, and it it kind of falls into that highly aromatized category between Amari and cordials. So, thanks to our listener Michael for calling out that inconsistency and allowing us to set the record straight, and also for giving me an excuse to talk about the Vucare, which I'm always happy to do. 
This week's guest is Maggie Hoffman, who has a really fascinating background in cocktails, which we dig into a bit during the interview. She's here to talk about her book, The One Bottle Cocktail, and we'll be giving away a signed copy of that book because we love you. How do you get in on that? Pretty easy. Today's episode will air first on March 22nd, 2018, and at some point during the day, we'll plaster Instagram and Facebook with posts about this giveaway. All you have to do is follow Maggie on whatever platform you're on, and then comment on our post by tagging one or two friends who might like to join you in experimenting with some one bottle cocktails because when you win this book, that's clearly the first thing you'll want to do. Some of the things Maggie and I discuss in our conversation include how she came up with the concept for the one bottle cocktail and who she wrote it for, the essential bottles to have on your bar if you're looking to make a one bottle drink, which fresh ingredients to have on hand if you want to up your home bartending game, thoughts on simplicity and complexity in cocktails, and much, much more. This ended up being a pretty deep conversation, and I know it gave me a lot to think about in terms of how I approach cocktails. So, without further ado, please enjoy this eclectic conversation with Maggie Hoffman. Maggie, thanks for being on the show. Thanks so much for having me. What I'd love to do is just have you introduce yourself to our listeners and kind of give us your background and tell us what you do. Sure. My name is Maggie Hoffman. I've been writing about cocktails since around 2009, and my first book is coming out March 6th, and it's called The One Bottle Cocktail. It's all about drinks that you can make even if the only liquor you have in your house is a bottle of vodka in the freezer or some bourbon someone left at your house after a party. Awesome. So that's exciting. Your first book. What was the process of writing that like? Can you kind of describe what that's like? Well, I've been writing on the web for a long time. I founded the drink section of the food site Serious Eats a while back. And so I've written about cocktails and wine and beer and sort of trying to make drinks more accessible to normal people at home and more accessible to cooks for a long time. Um, and this book came about... It was sort of a fluke, but when you run a website, you get to see what people really want to read. And we did a story once that was, you know, showing a lot of hip cocktails and recipes from bars. And it's so fun to go talk to bartenders, but people would complain that they just couldn't make those things. And I would get a lot of books in the mail that were books from bars. And, you know, those bar books are so beautiful and so great to have. But then when you get into it, you realize you really can't make the drinks. And I have a huge liquor collection. People send me booze to write about it. We have a whole wall of our living room and actually two closets full of booze. And I still couldn't make a lot of the drinks in the cocktail books that were coming out. Um, and so we did a story on Serious Eats that was you know, springtime, people start thinking about gin again. And the question was, what can you make with gin and a trip to the grocery store or the farmer's market? And it was hugely popular. And the next year, it came up again. People were looking for that stuff. So it popped up, it was hugely popular again. And a friend of mine introduced me to an editor at 10 Speed Press named Emily Timberlake, who's responsible for a lot of the great cocktail books that have come out in the last couple of years, the Smuggler's Cove book she edited and she edits Robert Simonson's books. We met up for a drink and she was saying, oh, it's really hard to edit books because you have to have an idea that's still going to be sort of cool two years later. And I said, well, the internet's not actually all that different. You're looking for stories that will be popular a year later. And she said, like what? And I said, like, you have a bottle of gin and you're going to get dinner supplies. What can you make? And she turned to me and said, that's a book. How quickly can you write it? <laughs> that's a really cool story. And I really love how you used kind of the back end metrics and analytics from Serious Eats to inform an actual, you know, 
piece of long form content. It's not just an article. It's, uh, you know, obviously a much more in depth and kind of labor intensive collection, but it's cool that it started out from that seed that had a really good proof of concept behind it. Mm -hmm. So you talked a little bit about, you know, kind of your personal experience with not being able to make a lot of the cocktails in these popular bar driven recipe books, even though you have this huge liquor collection can you talk a little bit more about maybe your ideal reader or the person that you're really writing this book for? Sure. I was picturing a few different people. One was you're on vacation and you're somewhere beautiful. And obviously you might start cocktail hour a couple hours early. You're on vacation. And in that situation, you're renting a house. You'll probably stop at the liquor store. It's not the place you're going to find a collection of Amari unless you're in Italy, maybe. It's not, you know, if you're in Hawaii, you're lucky if you can find a good bottle of tequila or a good bottle of rum. And so I wanted that person to still be able to make drinks they really want to drink, modern drinks, the kind of drinks you'd have in a hip restaurant or great bar today, but without having access to all the supplies. So I was thinking about vacationers. I was also thinking about people just getting into cocktails who might see an, a recipe that calls for three bottles and realize, oh, wow, a bottle of chartreuse could be $40 and I don't have any vermouth or my vermouth is six months old and that's going to be another $15. Pretty soon you could have spent $75 on a drink that you don't even know if you like it yet. So I recommend going to bars and tasting things. But when you're at home, I love the idea of people being able to make drinks without that investment. And I think especially people who cook are willing to do a little bit of DIY. And, you know, if you can make tea, you can make a hibiscus tea simple syrup. You're just making tea and stirring in some sugar. I like to make simple syrup in a mason jar and just shake it up so there's no stirring. Um, and I think people are willing to do those things to save $20 and taste something a little bit different. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I definitely want to know where you're getting your $40 chartreuse because I'm paying 60 down here in DC. <laughs> um, no way. Yeah. All right. So we, we, you just gave us this really great example of, you know, the hibiscus syrup where, you know, it sounds like kind of an ingredient that if you were to look for it at the store, you're probably not going to, you know, come across this, but is really easy to produce on your own at home. So that's a really nice little bar hack. Can you kind of talk without giving up too much of the secret sauce about some of the types of ingredients and moves that people are going to come across uh, when your book comes out? Sure. So when I talk to bartenders, I talk to about a thousand bartenders in the first round. And I think about 300 of the recipes I ended up testing. And these are my favorite 83. And I did notice some themes because these bartenders had to be really creative and think about the elements of a cocktail. A classic cocktail has to have bitters. And there were plenty of bartenders who said, kind of screw you. These aren't cocktails. If you don't have bitters, they're not cocktails. And then there were people who said, oh, this is a really interesting challenge. What if I got the bitterness that I need to balance this drink by muddling the grapefruit twists in with the raspberries so that you're sort of balancing that fruity tart flavor with a sort of bitter backbone? complete citrus turned out to be a magic tool that, you know, shaking with the whole spent lime or with or muddling a, a wedge of lemon instead of just adding the juice. Another thing that turned out to be really powerful was tea, all sorts of tea, green tea with jasmine that has the floral flavors that you might find, you know, in St. Germain, who knows what that costs near you. Um, and Taking a black tea and steeping it for a long time can add a bitter layer that's really wonderful for balancing the sweetness that you might get if you're using honey or some other sweetener. Um, and the sweeteners themselves can add really complex flavor. You know, if you're using demerara sugar, that's a darker sugar with some really rich, complex flavor. Um, and I played around with different types of honeys. Some of them have a very earthy flavor. 
So there are a lot of things that are just in your pantry that aren't expensive or that you can find at Whole Foods that can add really cool flavors. And the bartenders really worked a lot with savory ingredients as well. So there's a drink with um, cilantro and there's a drink with celery and there's even sesame oil, which just adds you know, makes these drinks, they're not just spiked lemonade. They have sort of all the flavors you're looking for in a balanced cocktail. Right. Yeah. It's kind of interesting that you mentioned the idea of spiked lemonade, right? Because if, you know, you're thinking about, well, how do I take the bottle of vodka in my freezer and make a cocktail out of it? You know, that's one of the first things that's going to come to mind for a lot of people. So it seems like with this book, you're trying to strike a balance between feasibility and still, on the other hand, feeling like you have a fancy drink. I guess to that end, what are some of the most flexible bottles that you can have on your bar or ingredients that you can have on your or have in your fridge or or in your pantry um, to make some of these things that are going to be coming out in the book? Well, I mean, I think people should just go with their favorite spirit to start, but I'd like them to also get a bottle of Mezcal. For me, Mezcal is cheating. It's so delicious on its own, you know, made from roasted agave. It has a savory flavor and an herbal flavor and a good bottle of Mezcal should absolutely be sipped on its own, but it makes such great cocktails. And one of the things that was sort of surprising in the process of putting together these recipes was that basically because there's a single spirit, because you're not working with liqueurs that might have different levels of sweetness, I discovered sort of that the bartenders were making a fresh mix, essentially a fresh cocktail mix and then adding a spirit. And that sometimes it turned out that the spirit base was flexible and that if a drink was designed around the herbal grassy flavors of tequila, sometimes it was also delicious with gin, which has herbal character. And if the drink was designed around sort of the richness of barrel aged rum, sometimes bourbon worked as well. And so what I did is I tested all the drinks again with multiple spirits. And then at the end of each chapter, I added a list of more things to use that bottle in. So if you make the six tequila drinks and you want more, it turns out there are a handful more throughout the book where you can use tequila instead of the spirit that was initially intended. That's really, really nice. I love that you just kind of took a standard format, which is, you know, all right, this chapter is going to be about this spirit and the next chapter is going to be about a completely different spirit. And you built in some really great flexibility in there, uh, especially if, you know, somebody discovers a recipe that they really love and they're not quite ready to, to let that recipe go. You know, it's kind of still, I don't know what the flavor equivalent of an earworm would be, but it's kind of like that flavor that they're thinking about. And then you can kind of enhance that by just swapping out the spirit and allowing them to play more. And I, I think that's just such a lovely uh, feature of the book. I found myself not that long ago at a dinner party when people sometimes say this to me, like, oh, can you make a drink with no warning? Which that's like, can you do a magic trick? Like I didn't bring my rabbit. But these people had everything in their fridge to make one of my favorite drinks in the book, which is made with grapefruit and lime and hot sauce and honey. And that's the base. And it's meant to be made with pisco, which is lovely and floral. And grapefruits are kind of floral and honey kind of enhances that. And it really all works together. But of course, she didn't have a bottle of pisco. And I was so glad that I knew this will work great with tequila. And so I was able to make this drink even with no preparation. That's a really, really good case study for sure. So one of the things I wanted to quickly talk about on I suppose a slightly more theoretical level before we jump into the lightning round questions here is the role of simplicity and complexity in cocktails. And I feel like this is one of those age old debates, kind of like the bitters debate, you know, like what is a cocktail? Does it necessarily need bitters? Does it not? Um, this, the simplicity complexity debate in cocktails for me is, has more to do with, you know, is a cocktail by nature, this complicated mishmash of ingredients, 
or is a cocktail, can it be something that's much more simple? Um, and at that point, I suppose people start calling them highballs and, and mixed drinks. So partially it's a definition question, but partially it's, it's a values question as well. So I, I just wanted to hear your thoughts on simplicity and complexity in cocktails. You know, there are great bars today that make simple cocktails really well, especially people who are trained by Sasha Petrasky, Milk and Honey. They're making great simple drinks. And then some of the modern classics you'll see are riffs on those drinks. You know, maybe they're using scotch instead of another spirit. And those are wonderful. These days, I tend to blame cocktail competitions for the increasing crazy complexity of drinks. And I think Instagram as well is responsible that bartenders who are now in this career for their whole lives, it's such a cool career and industry to be in, feel pressure to do something crazy, something new, something truly creative. And these things get really complicated. And, you know, some places it turns into a whole performance that the glass is filled with smoke and, you know, they're using a house blend of four different vermouths and bars have learned how to produce incredibly complex cocktails and take advantage of the economy of scale. And that's where things have shifted is that a bar can make the most complex cocktails they ever have. And it can make sense for them because they're producing them for a hundred people. So at Trick Dog, I live down the street from Trick Dog, which is this amazingly creative cocktail bar where they do a new menu that's beautifully designed every six months or so. And you look at the ingredients list and you think this is going to take forever. And it doesn't because they have figured out a system to make these drinks at scale and they can just add the fresh ingredients at the last minute. And so they have their house waffle liqueur and they have this smoked thing and this infused thing and all these fussy, crazy things, or they're serving something that's been aged in a barrel and something that's 40 years old. It's not going to be something you do at home. And so what I've been saying lately is that there's never been a time where what's happening in bars And what's happening at your home cocktail hour have been more different. That's a really interesting, uh, I guess, distinction to draw. And I don't, I don't think I'd thought of it that way. You know, there's always a very apparent difference between home bartenders and professional bartenders and bar settings, of course. But I really like that you're drawing out that contrast. And I think that's something that we may have to think about, especially because, you know, This podcast is for home bartenders, uh, and yet I also have the opportunity uh, because of the products that we make to speak with so many actual bartenders out there. Uh, So even though there's such a great distance or a great difference now, maybe uh, some more conversations between home bartenders and, and professional bartenders might be really interesting, I think. Yes. And, you know, bartenders aren't wrong to get excited about new products, but that's also where people at home get left out, that a bartender receives Chiro and aloe liqueur, and I don't even know what it costs, and I'm sure it's super cool. What an interesting flavor profile. But I can't publish a recipe with Chiro in it because most people don't have it and can't find it. Right. And I mean, we are guilty to a certain extent as well here at Modern Bar Cart. We just launched a collection of cocktail bitters that includes, you know, a Japanese style bitter with wasabi and seaweed and green tea and shiitake mushroom. So it's, you know, it's a very specific thing. And we obviously want to make cocktails that feature that. But that sounds awesome. (laughs) Yeah, it's it's really cool. And so we're trying to get it into folks hands so they can play with it. But that's certainly not going to be the sort of thing that I recommend everybody have on their bar at all times. It just doesn't make sense. So it seems like your book is is coming, A, at a great time, and B, that you really did the research and took the time to, to keep your end users in mind. And I, I know folks who listen to this podcast are, are going to be really interested in that when it comes out. So we'll make sure that uh, we do give them all the details on that and and how to maybe get in touch with you at the end. But I, I was hoping we could do some quick lightning round questions. Great. So 
Question number one, what is your favorite cocktail? And if you don't have a favorite of all time, what's something that you've recently been obsessed with? I like a last word and I like a riff on a last word. I like a bitter last word. If it's sour and it's bitter, I'm happy. Yeah. So what is the, what is the riff on the last word? Oh, there are lots of directions you can go. You can use chinar, and that's really delicious. Basically, almost any riff on the last word makes me happy, and I like it with rye instead of gin. Okay. So are you, you're mainly taking out, I'm guessing, the base spirit and the maraschino? Maraschino? You know, I mean, we make so many of them, and it just seems to be a template that whenever a bartender says, I have a riff on the last word. I always want to try it. Yeah, absolutely. The last word is actually my favorite cocktail as well. We have one that we wrote about on Serious Eats that is called the bad word. And it keeps the gin. And then it's made with green chartreuse and Grand Classico, which, you know, is a wonderfully complex sort of cousin to Campari. Mm, That sounds really nice. Very cool. So we've got your favorite cocktail. I think we may have already answered this, but maybe we can return to it. What is your favorite spirit? Oh, it's hard to choose. I love mezcal and I love drinking mezcal neat. These days, I don't tend to drink a lot of other spirits neat, except I do tend to drink scotch and Japanese whiskey on their own. And I love those. Yeah. Very nice. Any particular brands uh, or would you prefer to hold off? There's so much more exploring to do. I would love to get to Japan and explore those distilleries and taste more. Absolutely. Nice. So you are an author, obviously. As an author, are there any books about cocktails or home bartending that were influential for you personally? Sure. I mean, I think everyone loves the Death and Co book, and I loved how that one talked about the way that they designed and the way that they riffed on cocktail recipes. I've always loved that. There's been so many great recent books, and I love a nerdy deep dive. I think the Smuggler's Cove book is an amazing piece of history. I was a history major, and so I'm always amazed when people can get the history of the cocktail world because it's all sort of fuzzy and people tell all sorts of lies and half truths and we've all been there at the bar and someone tells a story and you think that can't possibly be true so i love when people really dig in to both the stories about the drinks and the larger cultural context around drinks Well, we'll definitely link to those two in the show notes so folks can maybe follow up on those recommendations. And speaking of recommendations for our listeners, uh, if you had to give any piece of advice to somebody who is just starting out on their journey as a home bartender, besides grab my book when it comes out in March, (laughs) what advice would you give them? I think it's good to spend time in bars and figure out what flavor profile you like. If you go to a bar and your favorite drink is always the sour one, that's where you should start making drinks at home. And if you love an old fashioned, then you can look at all of the sort of descendants of the old fashioned. If you love a Manhattan, look for that. So I think a lot of it is about discovering your own taste. You know, I think it's the same with anything. If you want to get interested in wine, the first thing to do is figure out what you like. Yeah. Absolutely. And at a bar, you know, a bar menu or a bartender can be a really good tools in that uh, pursuit. We like to talk about how here at Modern Bar Cart, we are kind of trying to be people's guide as they work their way through the journey of home bartending, like Virgil was Dante's guide as he was going kind of through the inferno. We're not the main character, obviously the bartender, the you, the, the person who is making the drinks is the main character. And Along the way, it's really great to find people and publications that can kind of act as your guide. So definitely a great recommendation there. I also think people really need to invest. And that's where I think the one bottle cocktail, starting with just one bottle, means buy a great bottle. 
Yes, absolutely. It's good to have something that's flexible and maybe that's not going to break the bank, but obviously quality in equals quality out. Absolutely. Maggie, thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. Is there any way you can let folks listening know how they can get in touch with you or where they can keep on the lookout for your book? Yeah. So the book is available for pre-order now. And I believe if you order it now, it'll be in your hands on March 6th. But I'd love for people to join on Instagram. I'm at Maggie J. Hoffman on Instagram. And that's a great way to see little previews of the book and little previews of the next one I'm working on and all of the celebrations for the book and bartenders I hang out with. So join me there. Send me a message. Absolutely. And will you be doing any sort of promotional tour going around a few cities in the U.S.? You know, as of now, we're doing a lot of Bay Area stuff and trying to spend a lot of time connecting with media all around the country. So hopefully media will write about their local bartenders who are in the book. Um, and those those are the real stars. Fantastic. We do actually have a decent sized chunk of Bay Area listeners. So that's actually a, a great little thing to keep your eye out for if you're one of our uh, California folks. So Maggie, thanks again so much. Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, there's two big things you can do for us here at Modern Bar Cart. One would be to tell your friends and family if you think they'd enjoy listening to us talk about cocktails. And if they don't download podcasts, they can always stream our episodes on their desktop directly from the show notes page at modernbarcart.com. The other thing you can do to help would be to head on over to iTunes or wherever you download your podcasts and leave us a review. Five stars are great, but we're more interested in your feedback. And the beauty is, the more reviews we have, the easier it will be for other folks out there to learn about our show. We're trying to start a cocktail revolution here, and by spreading the word, you're helping us fight the good fight. You can always reach us by emailing podcast at modernbarcart.com if you're looking for cocktail or bartending advice, or if you're a pro who would like to pull up a mic and be interviewed for all to hear. Also, definitely follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Modern Bar Cart for cocktail porn, recipes, and entertaining tips. And keep an eye out for new product releases and special offers, which are happening all the time. We love our listeners, and we really enjoy giving you exclusive discounts and sneak peeks at our latest and greatest cocktail projects. This episode may be over, but for you, the mixological fun and adventures are just beginning. So remember, folks, drink responsibly and experiment boldly. This episode was made possible with editing and production assistance by Samantha Reed, amazing cocktail insights by Maggie Hoffman, and a little bit of interview magic by yours truly. This has been a Modern Bar Cart production, copyright 2018.